I am alone in the world, said the friendless girl. I have nothing to look for but what my own labor can bring me. And while that little pink-faced chit Amelia, with not half my sense, has ten thousand pounds and an establishment secure, poor Rebecca, and my figure is far better than hers, has only herself and her own wits to trust to. Well, let us see if my wits cannot provide me with an honorable maintenance, and if some day or the other I cannot show Miss Amelia my real superiority over her. Not that I dislike poor Amelia. Who can dislike such a harmless, good-natured creature? Only it will be a fine day when I can take my place above her in the world. As why, indeed, should I not? Hello and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time we have read Vanity Fair by William Makepeace Thackeray. It's a really big book. It is the longest book ever. Well, that's not quite true. It is longer than Moby Dick <laughs> and shorter than Middlemarch, but it felt eternal. It felt so long. And so I apologize if this episode is a little bit later than we wanted it to be, but you know, it's a long book. We had to get to the end of it. It was really fun though to read too, though. Like it took absolutely forever, but I found myself really enjoying it. And so I do feel like it's one of these books that, you know, we identify sometimes you could dip in and out of. It is a book you could do that with, like skip parts of the plot and just enjoy the juiciest bits. Yeah. Once you know what the plot is, because mm-hmm. there's a lot of plot and it comes at you in weird ways at weird times. And then there are these long digressions. And definitely, if I read this book again, I will know better when to skip ahead. Again, though, it's got to be a novel, uh, and in this, it would be a little bit like Great Expectations, a novel that you get a huge amount of pleasure reading in a serialized way with friends or with, you know, with a reading community, because there's so much detail and like a character will appear and you'll be like, who the heck is that? And maybe somebody else will remember who it is, right? It's incredibly intricate tapestry. We talked a bit last time when we did Great Expectations about how Dickens has a reputation of writing as if being paid by the word, but how that wasn't really the case for Great Expectations. This felt much more like being paid by the word. There are some very long digressions at times that probably didn't need to be there. Not that they're bad. They're just long. There's just a lot of it. And also the the time of the novel is kind of weird. Like, you must have noticed this too, right? There are all these chapters where, like, he'll tell you a bunch of stuff and then he'll have to back up. Oh, God, yes. Right? It's so weird. It's, it's very confusing. And yet also juicy. I don't want to discourage people. It's like, I don't know, I find it really titillating and I just love one of the characters. Oh, yeah. No, there's definitely plenty of good things to enjoy about it. But I can also understand why anybody who's reading it might get frustrated and put it down. But I will also say this is one of the more consistently casually racist books we've read. Mm -hmm. Um, That kind of content comes up a lot, and we'll probably be reading some descriptions from it and talking about it a bit. If you're not in the mood for that right now, you can put this episode off until you're feeling up for it, if you ever are. That's fine. Uh, It's not like it's an incredibly searingly racist book that we're endorsing. It's certainly nothing like that. But there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in this book. It's extremely casual in its racism. There's like a playful quality to it. The racism is not in the service of demonizing characters. That's not to reduce its impact. It's 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 a curious manifestation of it, um, and it's worth noticing that. And I guess it's also worth saying, you know, every book that we've looked at so far has been either a book that I've already read, or a book that I was meaning to read for a long time, or maybe a book that I hadn't really heard of until you brought it to the table. This is the first book that I had heard of that. I just assumed I was going to never read in my life. (laughs) It was a long 19th century English novel, which is usually not my cup of tea, uh, or at least it has no special attraction to me. And I didn't know enough about it to say, oh, this is a reason why you'd want to read this book. But I've read it now, and I'm glad. And and we read it because C.L.R. James, who wrote The Black Jackmans that we talked about a while back, this was one of his touchstone books. And he found it very useful when he was young to read this book and to help him think about issues of class. And that that got me very curious, because if somebody like C.L.R. James can take some inspiration from it, I wanted to know more about it. That suddenly became the reason I wanted to read it. Yeah, and to some extent, we actually built the cluster around that, which I think is very cool. Yeah, and so I do want to say that, like, although there is constant casual racism in the book, it's something that, you know, anti-colonialist activists from the West Indies were able to read and think with in ways that they found really helpful. Hmm. With that said, we should probably start talking a bit about the book. 
let me uh, let me give you a little bit of a plot summary. <laughs> and you're going to have to truly summarize because there's so much plot. Yeah, I'm going to leave a lot out. But I guess, spoiler warnings, um, it's probably better to read the book knowing some of it. It was really weird reading this, not having any clue where the book was going. <laughs> Woo. Uh, anyway, this is a book that follows characters for about 20 years, and it, a lot of things happen all the time. So broad outlines, we begin in London in 1814, which is about 40 years before the novel was written. Two girls are leaving boarding school on the same day, Rebecca Sharp and Amelia Sedley. Amelia, also known as Emmy, is heading home to her up-and-coming merchant family, through whom she has some great expectations, including George Osborne, the son of another up-and-coming merchant family. Since childhood, the families have planned for Emmy and George to get married. Becky, on the other hand, is leaving school to take a job as a governess. Her parents were an artist and a, quote, opera girl, which may or may not be slang for a prostitute, but either way, she comes from a very humble family, and what's more, both of her parents have died, and she has no known relatives. But she's smart, and she can be charming, and she's attractive, and so it's not too hard for her to land a position as a governess with a good family. But before that job begins, she's going to spend a little time with Amelia's family, and she will immediately attempt to get Amelia's older brother, Joseph, to marry her. Now, Joseph has very little to recommend him as a prospective husband in terms of his personality and looks, but he has worked as a district collector in India, so someone in charge of administrating a region under the British colonial rule of the time, and therefore he's the richest bachelor Becky has ever met, and Becky would rather get money out of him than work as a governess. But Joseph never manages to propose to Becky, and although Amelia's family is initially charmed by her, her constant scheming eventually turns them against her. And so the book goes. Becky takes on her job as a governess with the Crawley family, led by Sir Pitt Crawley, baronet. So unlike Amelia's family, the Crawleys have some nobility. And she charms and ingratiates herself to them, and ends up marrying Rawdon Crawley, the young and wayward son of the family. But in the process of achieving that goal, she manages to turn the rest of the family against her. Meanwhile, back with Amelia, her beloved George Osborne is actually sort of not all that into her. <laughs> His friend, William Dobbin, thinks that she is the purest angel who ever walked the earth, but George finds her kind of dull. And yet, eventually, she does marry George. And then George, William, and Rawdon are all called up for military service and fight against Napoleon's armies at the Battle of Waterloo. George dies in the battle, having been married to Amelia for just six weeks, and leaving her a portrait, a son, and some very romanticized notions of what her husband was like. And it goes on. Amelia's father makes some terrible investments and the family's fortunes collapse. She spends many years in poverty. William continues to be devoted to her and supporting her, but she could never forsake the memory of her husband by marrying again. Come on. <laughs> Becky continues to climb her way into the highest strata of society, charming, manipulating, and ruining everyone in her path. But eventually, Becky gets tied up in a scandal with somebody who's too powerful for even her to control and her fortunes collapse, and she has to flee the country. And eventually, Amelia's fortunes start to improve. Eventually. And there's a lot tied up in all that, but that's basically the shape of the book. It's so awesome. And I love the way it's built around the lives of these two women. It's kind of famously a novel without a hero, right? But it's got these two poles, which I think are fascinating. So yeah, the subtitle of the book is A Novel Without a Hero by which Thackeray seems to have meant none of these are heroic characters, right? We're not really rooting for any of them. They are all very flawed. Mm -hmm. Everyone in this book is flawed, even the best characters. Yeah, no one is truly a good person. You know, remember when we were reading Great Expectations, we were like, you know, Joe Gargery is a good person. And so, you know, like, we, we could identify. Nobody is a good person. Nobody is totally bad either. Like, there's no complete villain. But there's also no one who's good. They're good and bad acts, but they're not good and bad people. No, in many ways, it's more important for them to be enjoyable. Mm. Although I get the sense that Thackeray did seem to think that he was writing some sort of instructive moral text, but... Sort of. Sort of. I mean, it keeps <laughs> dipping into this. I mean, okay, one of the main things about this book, in addition to its tremendous length and tremendous number of events that happen, is the fact that the narrator is also an important character. Not necessarily an important character in the action, but an important character in the sense that constantly interrupting, a bit like in Middlemarch, but even more so. I was thinking a bit about the Aeneid, 
Virgil famously interrupts the poem with these long metaphors Mm -hmm. that just Mm -hmm. go on, you know, like a bird floating above the sky, flying after its prey at the end of a hot day, whatever. It just goes on for lines and lines, and you're sort of like, okay, okay, that was pretty, but (laughs) that took a while. Same thing happens here, where you get interruptions that usually lead to a sort of tableau of fictional characters with ridiculous names that are enacting the moral precepts that are going on in this particular moment. So at some point, Becky is trying to make amends with George Osborne because they've done some wrong or so forth. And she asks, do forgive me, and holds out her hand. And then the narrator says, by humbly and frankly acknowledging yourself to be in the wrong, there is no knowing, my son, what good you may do. I knew once a gentleman and a very worthy practitioner in Vanity Fair who used to do little wrongs to his neighbors on purpose and in order to apologize for them in an open and manly way afterwards. And what ensued? My friend Crocky Doyle was liked everywhere and (laughs) deemed to be rather impetuous, but the honestest fellow. Becky's humility passed for sincerity with George Osborne. Yeah, there's like little moments where like pops out into this other frame of reference. I don't know. Are they really moral? Because they're more almost like, I don't know, pragmatic or even sometimes kind of exploitative. Like there's a moment when he's talking about Miss Crawley, you know, and the, the, the how wonderful it is to have like an aged, unmarried woman in the family that everybody can sort of hope they'll inherit money from. And we get this little authorial digression where he says, ah, gracious powers, I wish you would send me an old aunt, a maiden aunt, an aunt with a lot lozenge on her carriage and a front of light coffee colored hair, how my children should work work bags for her and my Julia and I would make her comfortable. Sweet, sweet vision. You know, in other words, this idea that, you know, I too, the author says, right, could inherit a lot of money if I only had a maiden aunt with a ton of money. And so it's like these little, I don't know, it's not moral exactly. It's here, at least it's kind of exploitative or, but he, he puts himself into the story in a way that's very different from the other novels we've been reading. Well, I think part of it is also that we're getting through these little digressions, a chance to see more people in Vanity Fair, Mm -hmm. in this world that he's trying to depict to us of these up-and-comers, of these people who are striving for money and for rank and status and class. So these give him little chances to step away from the main characters and bring in clearly fictional other characters that are just like, yep, here are other examples of that. Or I too am like this, you know, sort yeah. of I mean, I, I'm also playing the game. And also you, reader, are also playing the game. There's a beautiful example of this when he kind of goes, oh, ladies, you know what this is all about. He's just been talking about how Becky has diamonds that she keeps secret from her husband, right? Like she, she has like a stash, right? That she keeps secret. And um, he says, uh, To know nothing or little is in the nature of some husbands. To hide in the nature of how many women. Oh, ladies, how many of you have surreptitious milliner's bills? How many of you have gowns and bracelets which you daren't show or which you wear trembling? Trembling and coaxing with smiles the husband by your side who does not know the new velvet gown from the old one or the new bracelet from last year's or has any notion that the ragged looking yellow lace scarf cost 40 guineas. (laughs) Right. <laughs> Thus, Becky's husband knew nothing about the diamond earrings, right? So, like you too, reader, you you're playing this game too, right? And I, the writer, right, am playing this game as well in Vanity Fair. And none of us are heroes. No, <laughs> we should explain this like idea of Vanity Fair because I was thinking about this. You know, in a way, the title must be sort of super familiar to people, right? Because there's a magazine called Vanity Fair. And there's, in fact, been no less than five different magazines called Vanity Fair since the the early 19th century. But what Vanity Fair is referring to here is something quite different. Yeah. What is it referring to? Well, it's kind of complicated. It's simple and it's complicated. In a way, it's referring back to another novel, a 17th century, like, kind of allegorical, preachy kind of novel by John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. And this is a book we referred to when we were reading Little Women, because it's one of the books that the March sisters are very devoted to. Right? And, and there's even a chapter called Vanity Fair in Little Women that's most explicitly alluding to Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. But it's also in a funky kind of way, I think, also a little bit alluding to Thackeray. Um, so for Bunyan writing this allegorical novel with all these personifications and so on, um, Vanity Fair is meant to evoke for you the idea of one of these great big country fairs, a place where there is a lot of booths, there are things that catch the eye, there are things that appeal to you, and everything has its price. And for Bunyan, it's like a place that you can lose your soul or become corrupt, right? 
But it shows up here in a slightly different kind of way. And Thackeray does two things. He has this preface where he explicitly introduces this idea of Vanity Fair. And then he, every now and then, in these little authorial asides, he'll go, oh, Vanity Fair, you know, it'll say something about it. So what do you think Vanity Fair is? I was thinking of it in terms of a sort of shorthand for talking about this world of up-and-comers. It's kind of the marketplace of the world, right? Where your fortunes can go up and your fortunes can go down. There's the, you know, we see a bunch of scenes of people gambling, especially in the later part of the novel. And uh, we haven't talked about Thackeray's own life, but he, he lost a lot of money gambling early in life. And I feel like the roulette wheel, you know, is in a way almost like the emblem or like if you had to give one symbol to represent Vanity Fair, right? That roulette wheel is kind of there. Um, I also found myself thinking, I know this sounds a little crazy about Boethius, like the consolation of philosophy and the idea of fortune's wheel and the way in which, you know, things are going really well and then it all falls apart. And then, you know, things look really bad, but your fortunes suddenly rise again. And in Amelia's fate, but especially in Becky's fate, we get that sense of that turning wheel of fortune, um, which is also in a way the roulette wheel, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is that is the primary structure of the novel is that you know, Becky starts out at the bottom, goes way up towards the top, and then crashes back down to the bottom. And Amelia takes somewhat of the other route of starting much higher up, falling to pieces and then coming back together. And then there are all these many little cycles on that wheel as well. Like, it's not just the, like up, down through the whole course of the novel for Becky, for example. It's like up, down, up, down, up, down. And every time the stakes are kind of a little bit higher. That's what I mean about the roulette metaphor, right? The gambling metaphor. Like, you play round after round. You win, you lose, you lose, you win, you win, you lose, you win, you win. And you get up from the table richer or poorer, right? Yeah. And it's interesting that there are, you know, there are people who are not part of Vanity Fair, right? Who are just not important, so to speak, enough to to qualify for that. And there are also people who are so important that even though they are in Vanity Fair, they aren't as battered by the ups and downs of fortune. In particular, the most powerful person we meet, except perhaps the king, who makes a brief appearance. But Lord Steen is a very, very established upper class person who basically Becky has an affair with. Mm -hmm. And when it's over and she tries to assert any level of dominance over him, it's not happening. Like he could have her killed. No one would miss her. Like Mm -hmm. there's an absolute level of his power that she cannot ingratiate and charm her way into. Yeah. Though, though he is high up in that hierarchy, I don't think that means he's out of the fair. Like I think he too is vulnerable. And even people who appear to be sort of at the very edges of that are still within the game. So, for example, Becky's French maid, who very intelligently picks up all the diamonds that have fallen on the floor in the climactic showdown that Becky has with her husband, which I hope we'll talk about. It's one of the best scenes. Um, She gathers up the diamonds and some various other valuables. And Thackeray tells us, a lady very like her subsequently kept a milliner's shop in the Rue du Elder at Paris, where she lived with great credit and enjoyed the patronage of my Lord Steen. Yes. And um and he says, May she flourish as she deserves. She appears no more in our quarter of Vanity Fair. So she's still in Vanity Fair, but not in our part of the fair, not in our corner. So before we start talking about Becky and her fantastic character, is there anything else about Thackeray that we should know before we think about this novel some more? I didn't find his biographical background incredibly interesting, but there are a few things that are striking. So he was born in India, in Calcutta in 1811, and was sent to England by his widowed mother at the age of six. So probably had very limited memories of that time. He was educated at Cambridge and ran through his inheritance really rapidly. He traveled to Germany and those um, protracted scenes about Germany that we find in Vanity Fair are clearly kind of calling back to that, that time of life, I think. Uh, So he traveled, studied law for a while, went broke gambling, and then tried out a career as a painter in Paris. Um, So I think knowing the young Thackeray would have been pretty awesome. He got married to Isabella Shaw in 1836 when he was about 25. She had three children over three years. And then, probably following postpartum depression, she had a severe mental breakdown. And she spent the whole rest of her life in care, part of the time in sanitariums um, on the continent, part of the time with another household. So I think that personal circumstance has to have affected Thackeray's life in certain complicated ways. And a neat little fun fact is that the third of their daughters went on to marry Leslie Stephen, who was Virginia Woolf's father through his second marriage. And if you read Woolf's letters, she refers to the Thackeray family connections. 
So Thackeray, at this point, turns seriously to journalism and then novel writing. And Vanity Fair is definitely the most famous of his novels, though he also um, is pretty known for his Barry Lyndon, which was made into a movie by Stanley Kubrick, um, of mixed quality. A very okay <laughs> movie. <laughs> a very pretty movie. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. Very, but also very long. <laughs> oh, my God. And also his history of Henry Esmond, I think. Um, those are the two other famous ones of his novels. Vanity Fair was first published in the magazine Punch in excerpts of about three chapters. So it was sort of serialized. And that was during the period 1847 to 48. And then soon after that comes out as a full novel. Uh, he wrote a lot of stuff lots and lots of stuff, and had lousy health during the last decade of his life and died suddenly, probably of a stroke at age 52. So not all that old. And one thing that I find really fascinating about his biography is this India part. I I mentioned that he left India as a young child, but we get a number of glimpses into British colonial India in Vanity Fair, and I think that intersects with that personal history in interesting ways. His father, Richmond Thackeray, went to India very young when he was only 16 years old, and he was a civil servant with the East India Company that was basically running the British colonies in India at that time. Thackeray's mother was also raised in India, and his parents married there. But before that time, Thackeray's father had had another either marriage or common law marriage with a woman named Charlotte Rudd, uh, who had a daughter with him in 1804. And both that widow and that daughter were named in Thackeray's father's will. And Thackeray talks about this half-sister in his diary, especially when he was at the height of his gambling in early life. He worries that she, whether she has enough money or not. And then in 1841, after this half-sister had died in a letter to a friend, he talks about his black niece quote unquote, who had apparently come to stay with him in London. So, so he's got an ethnically Indian family. Hmm. And, and so it's kind of interesting, I think, reading those parts of the novel that are specifically are about India, but also that are about colonial rule. I, I think it puts them in, a, in an odd light. And one of the characters, as you mentioned, um, Joseph Sedley, he's also a sort of higher up civil servant in India. And while none of the action of the novel is set in India, we hear a lot about that world. So it's kind of in the background all the time. That's interesting. That biography does resonate with some of the themes and issues in the novel. And this, this, this whole, I mean, obviously we're not going to get too deep into the weeds with this, but that whole colonial environment, like that whole world of the empire, I mean, that's in, I guess, in the background of every 19th century English novel, right? And, and we've been thinking about that in this cluster of novels, but here it's just so in your face. Yeah, it's so explicit in a way that it usually isn't, or that I'm not used to anyways. You're reminded of it over and over and over again. I mean, from the very first page right? Where the casual racism of the novel kind of rears its head, right? Now, if we think about the novels organized around Becky and Amelia, and if we imagine a world of Team Becky and Team Amelia, do we feel that this would be an evenly divided set of teams or do we not? Well, no, I think a lot more (laughs) people are going to be on Team Becky uh, in that she is by far the more interesting character. She's often described as the protagonist of the novel, even though if you read it, there's clearly two. Um, And I think the first movie version, or at least an early movie adaptation of the novel, was just called Becky Sharp. Ah. So, Well, it's it's weird, right? That's why I'm wondering. Like, I I mean, I I think you're absolutely right. Like, I mean, I'm a team Becky all the way, right? And (laughs) I think that if you're asking modern readers, like, they're going to find things to admire in Becky, even if she's also really bad in some ways, right? And they're going to find it very difficult to admire Amelia. But I wonder about 19th century readers, you know, because Becky is really manipulative and cold. Like, she freezes out not only, like, adult human beings who might have affection for her, but her own child. I mean, so there are a lot of very negative qualities about her. And even though we find Amelia, like, sickeningly sweet, and I think even 19th century readers would at least after a while in the novel, find her that way too. Like, I I wonder how much of it is us and how much of it is the book. Well, I think she's painted to be really big, right? And and including all of her evilness, including things like the fact that she really does not care about her child. And, and, And she's just so monstrous in that way, right? She's doing things that are way outside of the norm for anyone. And I, I've seen her described as like the most evil woman in literature or things really? like that, which maybe, but... Yeah, you got to wonder where that comes from, right? Yeah, there are reasons why she might be doing some of this stuff. She puts no limits on herself for good or for ill, right? Yeah, and, and she is surrounded by people who are quite willing and happy to use and abuse her. So why should she not turn around and give them some of that in order to improve her standing? 
Yeah, that opening chapter really gives us a beautiful sense of her when she and Amelia are both departing from the, you know, the ladies finishing school where Amelia has been well looked after and Becky has sort of been able to scrape by while offering lessons, right, as a poor member of the household, right? And there's a generous act made by the sister of the proprietress of the school toward Becky, and Becky has nothing but contempt for this, you know? So we see her as ungrateful, but we also see her as not wrong to be ungrateful and to be ready to have sort of vengeance on the people who have treated her badly. So I feel like the novel lays out that sort of argument that there are reasons why she's doing this, but doesn't constantly bring them up every time she does something terrible, the way that it kind of brings up why Amelia is so good and so devoted to her dead husband. Well, the novel does this actually in a really subtle and interesting way, I think, through talking about mothers. Like, I think that the ways in which mothers are talked about in this novel is super interesting. So very early on, actually in the passage that we use in the cold open, just after that, Becky is reflecting on her own situation and, you know, who's able to look after, right? She's alone in the world, right? And Becky says this to herself, of what else have young ladies to think but husbands? Of what else do their dear mamas think? I must be my own mama, said Rebecca, not without a tingling consciousness of defeat as she thought over her little misadventure with Joss Sedley. Right. So on the one hand, it's just about the marriage game, right? As you see in something like Pride and Prejudice or whatever, you know, mothers are important to the brokering of the marriage market. And on the one hand, this is only about that, right? Becky's got to do her own brokering. She's got to manage the marriage game in her own way because there's no one else to do it for her. But it's also like an absence, right? It's also this thing that is not there in her life. And you wonder how much that early life, you know, is being played out here. As you mentioned, like, you know, her her mother is like an opera girl, right? Possibly a prostitute. Her father's an artist. And there's this little description that occurs of her life with her father, right? She's said to be a queer little wild vixen. It refers to her fun and mimicry. And it says how she used to fetch the gin for her father and the other artists and be a model for the painters. Right? So she's got this odd upbringing, which has made her charming, which has made her even more observant than maybe she would naturally have been. It's made her able to look out for herself. But in a way, it's made her what she is, right? I find that background to her really fascinating. I certainly loved that section with the father. I think that sounded like a just charming life and a real alternative to Vanity Fair, in a sense. You've got these artists who are hanging out and drinking, and and it didn't feel like it was as contaminated by the toxicity towards your fellow person that you find in Vanity Fair so often. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, right? It's idyllic in a sense because there's a kind of freedom in it, right? But there's also privation there, right? There's also lack. There's both of these things. There's this one really, really eerie passage where Becky and Rodden, they've they've gotten married and they're going back to the home that um, Rodden had grown up in. And it's also a place that Becky had spent an early part of her life. And they're in the carriage on their way. The governor has cut into the timber, Rodden said, looking about, and then was silent. So was Becky. Both of them were rather agitated and thinking of old times. He about Eton and his mother, whom he remembered, a frigid, demure woman, and a sister who died, of whom he had been passionately fond, and how he used to thrash Pitt, and about little Roddy at home. And Rebecca thought about her own youth, and the dark secrets of those early tainted days, and of her entrance into life by yonder gates, and of Miss Pinkerton, and Joe, and Amelia. It's such a weird passage, right? Because they're, they're silent, in the carriage together. And they're both thinking about the past, but they're thinking about different pasts, each their own. And in both cases, it's like secrets, because this is the only time we hear about the sister who died, who he was passionately fond of, right? So it gives you this like sudden little sharp glimpse into his character and that soft quality that's also going to emerge in the love he has for his son, right? And in a weird way, his love for Becky too, I guess. Um, it, it, it's there in, in embryo almost. And also Rebecca's dark secrets of those early tainted days. And we kind of know what those are, but we kind of don't, right? I don't know. I found that moment really uncanny. It, it is a really interesting moment. If I'm remembering correctly, this is when they're visiting the house because Sir Crawley Rodden's father has just died. That's right. And the, and so they're going to the funeral, basically. Uh, and this is the first time that they've been invited back. 
And it was with a lot of controversy because, of course, she's already burned her bridges with this family, with the rest of this family. And so some of those secrets involve the relationships that were amongst the people. She was secretly married to Rawdon long before anyone else in the family knew. She got a proposal from the now deceased father of Rawdon shortly after she got married to Rawdon, and she immediately regretted it. Because she could have been the wife of a baronet and said she's the wife of a baronet's son that they the family doesn't even like. And like she would have preferred to have the power. She doesn't really care about Rodden except for his utility, for the most part. Mm-hmm. And yet, she, obviously, she hasn't told this to Rodden. She can't tell anything to Rodden. She doesn't have anyone that she can be upfront all the time with, right? Because she's constantly playing the game. Becky's going to Becky. Yeah. Becky is always Becky. She doesn't tell anybody. Any of that stuff. Yeah. So there's a sense in which the, the, the complex web of, of emotions and connections that this event and this return to the scene of so much of their past brings to mind, it kind of reflects that like she is very much alone, even as she's returning to the family with her husband and very pointedly leaving the kid at home because she does not like that kid. Yeah. And it's, it's such a poignant and weird part of the novel. Like maybe we said, there's there's no good people in this book. There are no evil people in this book, right? There's just good acts and bad acts. And one of the things she does that's so disturbing and kind of revolting is the way she treats that child. Because the child worships her, right? He admires her, right? There's this one passage that's just so, it's like so sad. She nodded twice or thrice patronizing to the little boy who looked up from his dinner or from the pictures of soldiers he was painting. When she left the room, an odor of rose or some other magical fragrance lingered about the nursery. She was an unearthly being in his eyes, superior to his father, to all the world, to be worshipped and admired at a distance. It goes on about her her room being like almost a kind of fairy abode, a mystic chamber of splendor and delights. There in the wardrobe hung those wonderful robes, pink and blue and many tinted. There was the jewel case, silver clasped, and the wondrous bronze hand on the dressing table, glistening all over with a hundred rings. It's so weird. It's almost like her room is this magic place. She's almost like this fairy creature and totally inaccessible to him. And that feeling doesn't really last, right? The kid gets tired, I guess, of all this. Yeah. And, but it's fascinating, too, because it's an absolute counterpoint, as in so many other ways in this novel, to Amelia, who, how can I put it, is Amelia a good mother, would you say? <laughs> no. I mean, a better mother than Becky, but no. <laughs> like, she's not a neglectful mother, but my God, how cloying. Oh, my God. No, she hovers. Oh, my God. She's an absolute obsessive, and, and she doesn't see. All right, all right. So Amelia's husband <laughs> dies after only six weeks of marriage, which was already rough. They'd mm. already had fights. It was not a very happy marriage, but no. he died nobly in her eyes, and therefore all must be forgiven. And also, she has this image of herself as somebody who has always been devoted to George Osborne since childhood and was always going to marry him. And this has been her whole life's purpose was to be the wife of George Osborne, which was a hard one thing to be because, as I said, he didn't really care about her. But he, she achieved it, and then it was taken away from her. And so her purpose in life was very brief. And she's going to spend the rest of the novel, basically, mm-hmm. trying to live out that purpose, despite that moment having never been real in the first place. And so she takes that out on the sun as well. Like, the sun only exists for her as a memory of her dead husband, and, and therefore of a memory of like what she needs to be. Yeah, it's so creepy. She has no sense of self outside of her relationship with George, which is weird and awful enough. But like you were saying, the only meaning that that son has for her is to be like a little second George, you know, like a a replacement for his father. And she's just obsessive. And it's super creepy. Yeah, it's super overwhelming. Oh, my God. And so when he gets busted out of the house, right, um, she's, she becomes increasingly impoverished because her father's become financially ruined. So that her part of the family is increasingly impoverished. And she's finally persuaded to hand over her son, you know, little George to his grandfather, George's father, her husband, George's father, um, where he can be, you know, educated and lavishly taken care of and be the heir of his grandfather. And on the one hand, we're meant to like feel really bad for Amelia that she has to selflessly give up her child. But on the other hand, it's like, you know, thank goodness the poor kid busted out of there because it's like, he does so well when he's out of there. I mean, he's an arrogant little shit, but I mean, yeah. he's a clearly way happier. <laughs> you get this picture of Amelia as being this very pure and very devoted and very naive, mm-hmm. but like very charming in her 
simplicity. And she does a lot of good things. Like she takes care of her old parents as they become increasingly decrepit. I mean, those are generous acts, right? I mean, she's kind of irritating, but like these are good and generous acts she carries out, right? I mean, the other side of this is that George's friend, William Dobbin, has been pining for her his entire life. Mm -hmm. But he's the one who convinces George to actually marry her because she will otherwise die of heartbreak at, you know, 17 or however old she is at that point. But Dobbin selflessly convinces George to go and marry this woman who he would much rather marry and then continues to support her over decades and support the child and do everything he can for her in the hopes that maybe someday she would give up this dream of George and regard him. Uh-huh. And eventually, and when I say eventually, I mean in like the next to last chapter of the book, uh-huh. he, he realizes that this will never happen. And he hits the road. And he hits the road. And he's just like, <laughs> I've been doing this for so long. I'm done. I'm done. Yep. And the way he says it is, is particularly impressive to me. You, he says to Amelia, you are not worthy of the love which I have devoted to you. Yeah. Which changes Isn't that mind-blowing? everything. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because he's been worshiping her all this time. Yeah. And I mean, you could argue, like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go down the road of saying that, well, you know, Dobbin loved her really a lot. So therefore she should submit to him. Like, that's not what's going on. The thing is, she's already kind of submitted. Like, she keeps him around and enjoys his company and enjoys his support and like wants him to be there in the role of the husband figure for her and for her son and for her family but she wants to still have george but she wants to have george she wants to she wants to i think they say something like own him or toy with him and not actually commit to this relationship She's using him just like Becky uses men all the time, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not in the same ways, not no, with the same true. methodologies, but like that's right. It's it's all a matter of use. That's true. You're absolutely. Right. I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. It was the most delightfully shocking moment in the book to me. In many ways, was that suddenly we're going real hard on what a failure of a person Amelia is, <laughs> and I was there for it. No, it's a great moment. Yeah, the, what, do you, the, what do you think about the men of this? Like we've been talking a lot about the women, you know, Amelia and Becky. Um, like, what do you think about Dobbin? Do you like him, or do you think he's just like not so great? He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. are definitely good things to say about him. It's interesting how the book tries to make him look a bit selfish sometimes, a bit ugly sometimes, but yet also doesn't really want him to be that bad. I mean, he's definitely the closest thing the book has to the Joe Gargery type, right? Yeah, yeah. George Osborne's clearly an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right? Oh my but God. I mean, he was, again, quite young, but yes. He's such asshole. a jerk. Rodden starts out as a complete jerk. And then I like him. becomes completely sweet <laughs> by the end of it. He's completely softened by marrying somebody who he admits is better than him and mm-hmm. puts everything into her hands, which was a mistake with Becky being the woman in question, has a kid. And there's all these scenes where he's like, I love this kid so much. I know. But no one is allowed to know about it because toxic masculinity, basically. I like know. it would be, it's, he gets teased for loving his son, but he's just filled with love. I know. And it's a much better know. love than what Amelia feels for young George. Absolutely. It's so sweet. Yeah, no. So he comes out really great. Yeah. And he, I, one of the things I found really fascinating, so he's a very imperfect character, right? Like he's not the sharpest, you know, crayon in the box, right? And he trusts Becky, big mistake, right? But the climactic scene where he has the showdown with Becky is so exciting and so great. And there's this weird thing that happens. Tell me what you think about this. So he's been taken to, a, uh, I want to say a debtor's prison, but it's a really comfortable and pleasant debtor's prison because he, you know, he owes money. Like they always owe money, but he's he owes money. So he's not worried about this initially. He writes a note to Becky, you know, send some money so I can get busted out. And she sends him a note, but she doesn't send the money and she kind of puts him off. And he gets increasingly suspicious of this. And so he finds another way to get the money to get himself out. And he goes home. It's nine o'clock at night. He lets himself into the house with his key. He can hear laughter upstairs. He goes up and he finds Becky alone with Lord Steen. And she's all covered in the diamonds that Lord Steen had given her. And he's holding her hand. And Rodden comes in. Becky started up with a faint scream as she caught sight of Rodden's white face. At the next instant, she tried to smile, a hard smile, as if to welcome her husband. And Steen rose up, grinding his teeth pale and with fury in his looks. Right? So there's a big showdown, right? And Rodden attacks Lord Steen. You lie, you dog, said Rodden. You lie, you coward and villain. And he struck the peer twice over the face with his open hand and flung him bleeding to the ground. It was all done before Rebecca could interpose. She stood there, trembling before him. She admired her husband, strong, brave, and victorious. Come here, he said. She came up at once. 
And it's such a weird moment because obviously like toxic masculinity, not good to hit people and so on. But this has been coming for a long time, right? (laughs) And what's interesting to me is that this is the moment where I don't know if she loves him, but she admires him. She admired her husband, strong, brave, and victorious. It's like it's like a military victory almost. Or, you know what I mean? Like the militarism of this book that's usually in the background, the whole Waterloo, Napoleon, you know, Napoleonic Wars stuff that's always in the background here, like a kind of counterpoint. It's almost like this is a battlefield. I found that moment super weird. It's a really interesting moment, in part because it's unclear, as it is so often in this book, whether Becky is admiring him because she is honestly admiring him, or because that's the political move to make in that moment, when suddenly someone has come in and violently put over the person that you know, you've been caught cheating with, that you need to suddenly express, oh, my husband, you're so great. Yeah. Like, and you need to have that shine in your eyes to him. And the book very often has Becky doing things where it presents a reason for why she would be doing it, but also you don't know whether that's actually the honest reason or if she's playing some sort of game. Yeah. No, you're right. It could be either one, right? I mean, in that moment, she could be performing trembling and performing admiration because she's going to keep lying to him. Like she, they go off together. She forces him to like open up her stuff, her, her, her boxes and, you know, expose the money that Lord Steen had given her. Did he give you this? Rodden said, yes. Rebecca answered, uh, I'll give it to him today. And he says this, he says, you might have spared me a hundred pounds, Becky, out of all this. I have always shared with you. I am innocent, said Becky, and he left her without another word. And like, clearly that's a lie. Right? Oh, yeah. But, like, innocent is the last adjective we would use of Becky, right? <laughs> but but who is to know, like, what is real here? I, she's, a, she's a liar through and through, right? But I don't know what, like, I, I feel like that's a moment where we kind of almost know what's going on with her. But I mean, I'm not sure she's lying. I'm not sure it's real. Yeah, and as I as I was saying, the the text has had her in positions where she has seemingly felt something earnestly, and then a page later, it's revealed that no, this is not the case. So you can't even trust the narrator in terms of giving us an accurate account of when she's being sincere or not, whatever that means for Becky. One of the joys of the novel is how well it is constructed to allow those kinds of moments, to allow uh, the characters to not be clear in why they're doing the things they're doing. Sometimes that's super frustrating. There are times when Becky is just randomly catty or mean to people, including Amelia, where it's like, why are you doing this? Like, what, <laughs> who's benefiting from you being so mean right now? This is this is not a very smart or savvy thing. This doesn't seem like a very Becky thing to do. Mm-hmm. But there are lots of moments where it's really tantalizing how unclear her motivations are or or where the lines are being drawn in the novel. Yeah, you get a bit of that kind of ambiguity with another character. I don't think we've talked about Joseph Sedley, Amelia's brother. What do you think about him? Isn't he a weird character? Super interesting character. So he is marked as being not terribly brave. No. Not terribly good. Maybe even not terribly interesting. Not terribly nice. Self-absorbed, kind of gluttonous, a dandy. Yeah. And he's set up as the potential love interest in the very first section. And I think part of it is that he's there as someone who's kind of odious to show just how far Becky is willing to go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So she's she's willing to marry this unattractive man who lives in India. Oh, they have to go all the way out there, it even seems like. And, you know, plays a prank on her the very first time they, they meet at dinner by having her eat an incredibly hot pepper, which her palate is in no way accustomed to. He's such a jerk. <laughs> And the novel constantly shows him really enjoying and associating himself with things that maybe aren't entirely his to enjoy, including all sorts of stuff about India. Mm-hmm. Uh, he you know, carries people who make Indian food with him, even back in England. And also, he joins with everybody to go to Waterloo. He's not in the army. He could never yeah. be in the army. He's not fit for that. But he wants to be there, and he puts on the mustachios of somebody who's in the army, and he talks about having seen the Battle of Waterloo and having you know been there, part of the service. He pretends for the rest of his life that this was this was something that he did, hmm. but of course it wasn't. So he's he's there to be a sort of strong contrast, I think, to the rest of the male characters. <laughs> Yeah, he's funny. Like he's a he has weird kinds of weakness. So he's kind of vain and weak, and he's slow to do things. Like remember when there's that period of time when he and Dobbin are coming back um, to England after having been away for a long period of time, and like Dobbin is like constantly trying to get him on the road and to get him to like you know come see his family and stuff like that. And he's just 
it, he's always detached from other people somehow. Oh yeah, he's self pleasuring. He's he's he takes the trip from Southampton to London. And he eats at every single inn. And has to try this town's famous beer and has to do this and the other thing. And this is made all the more pointed by the fact that although he doesn't know this, his mother has died. Yeah, and and yeah. in a sense, he's going back to not only reunite with his family after a decade or so, but to find out this terrible news. He's so completely self-absorbed. And he's an odd little character, I think. Yeah. Though he'll turn up at the end in a necessary way. But he's a fun addition to a scene. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> and that's kind of what this book is about. It's about these terrible people who are doing very delightful things together sometimes, even if they're all awful. So we've decided to read this book in a cluster on class. And one of the interesting ways that class comes out is perhaps predictably in the marriage market, when people are trying to get married and make appropriate marriages, many, many parents are disappointed by their children getting married to people who have no money. In, in fact, almost none of the marriages of anyone in this novel are approved of by their parents, which is kind of fascinating. But in addition to that, we also get a lot of interesting racial dynamics coming out in the marriage market. Yeah, there's this weird kind of coming together of, of race and class and in unexpected kinds of ways. It happens for the first time very early on when there's some question that Becky might get married to Joseph Sedley. And surprisingly enough, his parents are not or his father, at least, is not negative about this. He's said to be neutral. Let Joss marry whom he likes, he said. It's no affair of mine. This girl, Becky, has no fortune. No more had Mrs. Sedley. She seems good-humored and clever and will keep him in order, perhaps. Better she, my dear, he says to his wife, than a black Mrs. Sedley and a dozen of mahogany grandchildren. <sighs> Yep. And here what he's talking about is the fact that Joss will be going back to India, right? And so that's going to be the alternative, that maybe he'll marry some, you know, woman from India. And again, thinking about Thackeray's own connections to that world, it's like, uh, it's super weird, right? So it's racist, casual racist language, right? And we're going to find this throughout the book. But in a weird way, it's normalized, like it's a conceivable alternative, it's a conceivable possibility within this whole world, right? What, that Joss would marry somebody from India? Yeah, like that that's, oh, that, yeah. That, that that could also happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, he's totally taken on that lifestyle. He's taken on all the trappings of it. He eats Indian food as often as possible. Like he's very into India yeah. as part of his identity. So that's totally possible. And then we find that it's not just the Sedley family or Mr. Sedley who's open to this kind of thing, like doesn't think this is inconceivable, maybe not desirable, but it's not inconceivable because George Osborne's father turns out to be extremely pro the idea of his son George marrying not Amelia, who had always been intended for him in years gone by, but Miss Swartz. And she is such an interesting character. She's a person who's a parlor boarder that is one of the most lavishly funded students at the same school, Miss Pinkerton School, that Becky had taught at and Amelia had been a student at. And she said to be fabulously wealthy. And George's father tries really hard to push a marriage between the two of them. And in fact, revoltingly enough, once George doesn't go for that, George instead gets married to Amelia. Later on, Mr. Osborne, whose wife has been passed away for some time, um, himself makes an offer for Miss Swartz. And um, her family's like, no. <laughs> like, it's just, it's like, it's suitable in every possible way. She's such an odd character in the way she's described. Because on the one hand, again, there's this casual racism. But on the other hand, she's a really amiable character. She acts in very positive ways. She's affectionate toward Amelia back when they're at school together, but also later on when her name comes up in conversation with George, when she's being presented as kind of a potential you know, marriage partner. And um, George just wants to talk about Amelia. She's, she's, she's really happy to hear about her old friend. And then she goes on to marry well, and she sort of shows up as a peripheral character later on. So it's racist, right? But it's also making room for people who are differently raced within Vanity Fair, within the marriage market, within these structures of power, because she ends up being someone who's in a very stable, you know, affluent, good kind of position in society. Yeah, she's she's really introduced strongly in the novel, let's say, when Mr. Osborne is trying to get George to marry her. And this is happening right after Amelia's family has lost all its money, and Mr. Osborne is forbidding George from marrying Amelia. And the idea being that Amelia is not good enough because now she has lost money. She has no money. And Miss Swartz is a good candidate for marriage because she has money. She has lots of money. And the, the idea that she has money even though she is racially marked is meant to 
push George even further towards Amelia by his disgust at this mm-hmm. at this trade off, right? Mm-hmm. Do you want money or do you want to marry a white person? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, well, George knows what he wants, mm-hmm. um, and then um, and then for for it to be so odious that that Mister Osborne himself would then deign or, or attempt to marry. Uh, Miss Swartz. It, it, it's sort of meant to show something of how financially motivated his character is, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's weird, right? Because on the one hand, this is about money and class. Right? And this is something we've seen before in Great Expectations and Emma, right? Um, so there's this moment where um, George has mentioned Miss Swartz to Amelia, and she's like happy to make that connection again. And he mentions how his sisters are really into Miss Swartz. And Amelia says that she said, I wish they would have loved me, wistfully, she said. They were always very cold to me. My dear child, says George, they would have loved you if you had had 200,000 pounds. Exactly. Right. So on the one hand, this is about money and class, but it's also like race is in here also. Um, and it has a certain value, right? It might take away from Rhoda Swartz's value to some extent, but she still has enough money that it pushes her up. Right. And so it's a very strange world. It's very different in that respect from the other novels we've been reading. It makes it all visible, right? It makes all that stuff visible. Well, this is a massive, massive novel with quite a lot going on in it, and we could talk about it for much, much longer. But unfortunately, time has continued to tick, and we have to wrap up. And we have to announce what we're going to be talking about next time. So we finished up our cluster on class, which is to say our cluster of 19th century English novels, and we're going to move on to a cluster on sports which I bet some of you were not expecting us to talk about, but here we are. <laughs> Originally, we were thinking about doing sports this summer because the Olympics were going to happen, which they're not. And then we thought, oh, maybe we should put it off. But on the other hand, people are so missing sports. It might actually be a really interesting moment to talk about the desire for sport and what that's for. And the idea of that kind of thinking about writing about sport came up a bit when we did our food cluster not so long ago. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to tackle these books and to think about this. We're going to be starting with C.L.R. James again. We're going to be looking at his Beyond a Boundary, which you may remember I raved about when we <laughs> talked about the Black Jacobins earlier this year. So it's a really good book. It is a weird hybrid of cricket reminiscences, autobiography, and post-colonial analysis, and contains quite a lot of thoughts about Vanity Fair. I mean, it's the reason we just read Vanity Fair. So we might still talk more about Vanity Fair next time as well. I can't wait to read that. The second book that we're going to be looking at, taking sports from a slightly different angle perhaps, (laughs) we're going to be looking at Virgil's Aeneid. Especially book five. Yeah. Book five, as you may know, has a lot of sporting games amongst the sailors heading off to found Rome. But yes, the Aeneid, the foundational epic poem of the Roman Empire, written, uh, how how do you describe that period? (laughs) Right around what year zero would be. (laughs) If that and, existed. Yeah. And like, I think it's going to be very neat reading it as part of a cluster on sports because I remember for the first time I read it all the way through getting to book five and I'm like, why is all the sports in here? What is going on? What is that for? But in fact, it's doing something incredibly important for the work as a whole. So I think that'll be a very neat way to approach it. I'm looking forward to it. And then finally, we're going to be doing a book that is perhaps a little less well known, but it's a book that I've been meaning to turn back to for a long time by one of my favorite authors. And we're going to be covering it near to when my birthday is. So I get to make this decision. <laughs> uh, we're going to be reading another curious hybrid novel by Georges Perec, a 20th century French writer, called W or the Memory of Childhood. It's a half autobiography. Uh, and it intertwines Perec's experiences as a child when he was separated from his mother during the Second World War with a story that he came up with when he was about 13 about an island whose society is entirely devoted to sports and Olympic-style competitions. And these two threads end up being more interestingly related than you might expect at first. I haven't read this book in a long time. I am incredibly looking forward to coming back to it and thinking about it and talking about it with you. And I hope I still like it. (laughs) It looks really neat. I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be great. So yeah, those will be our sports books. But until then, if you would like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. And we always love to hear from you. Show notes with links for things that we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 30. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at The Spouter Inn.